Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to Imperial College. Uh, I, uh, sorry we couldn't do very much about the weather for you this evening, <laughs> but uh, I hope you managed to find the room okay and uh, got a cup of tea before we start. Um, so it's my uh, honour to welcome Professor Peter Vari to give this evening's talk uh, to us. So uh, Peter uh, is currently the head of the Institute, and I have to check to get the exactly correct name, the Institute for Communication Systems and Data Processing at uh, the University in Aachen in Germany. And uh, he's come over for a short visit to visit uh, the laboratory here at Imperial College, where we do also some research on audio signal processing, audio and acoustic signal processing, actually. And uh, as part of this visit, we managed to sync up uh, with the AES meeting. So we're very warmly welcoming uh, AES to Imperial College this evening. So a little bit about Peter. Uh, actually, it's not possible to say a little bit uh, about Peter, so <laughs> uh, I have to leave a lot of things out um, in doing that. But um, of course, he has his biography on the internet, and you can download and read that if you want to. But I'll just pick some highlights. Um, I think um, uh, many of you have some of Peter's work in your pocket right at the moment, um, in that Peter was the leader of the research team in the development of the GSM full rate codec, out of which the AMR codecs and a lot of uh, kelp codecs have since uh, been derived. And um, this was when he was with uh, Philips, and I think that the date of this codec is uh, 1988, something like that. And then uh, he moved uh, shortly afterwards, a couple of years later, to Aachen and has since that time been, um, without a doubt, a leader of uh, audio technology and audio signal processing technology, as well as communications. Uh, getting that audio data around the world uh, is not an easy thing to do. And the synergy of uh, signal processing audio processing and communications uh, underpinned by information theory, I think is what has led to the success of the group in Aachen uh, that have uh, trained uh, engineers, researchers and scientists. And you can visit many companies and universities around the world. And quite often you'll find there's somebody who was uh, a student or a researcher in Peter's group in Aachen. So his impact has been very widely felt uh, in, in our world, uh, in, our, in our technology area. Um, and uh, the topics which he's covered in his uh, research are really quite wide, and I've got a few of them here um, in case they resonate with, with any people here. So combined echo cancellation and noise reduction, psychoacoustic noise reduction, artificial bandwidth extension, um, soft decision source decoding, and uh, many others beside. Uh, we've had very interesting discussions in these last couple of days uh, uh, about some of the research we're doing here, some of the research that is going on in Germany and the uh, relationships between them. So I know that he's going to give us a really interesting talk this evening. And uh, maybe I just finish off my brief introduction with um, noting that Peter is uh, now moving or has recently moved uh, maybe not even so recently, to cover also the area of hearing aids and hearing devices. Um, and so it's clear that he is not satisfied with having his technology just in our pockets, but he would like to get it somehow inside our ears as well uh, from hearing aid technology as well. So let me introduce uh, Professor Peter Vari. <laughs> Yeah, Patrick, thank you very much for that fine and nice introduction. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, mobile phones and hearing aids are communication devices which are quite often used in noisy environments. And the common feature is that signal processing is used to improve the communication. And the common feature is that uh, in view of the ongoing progress of uh, digital microelectronics, we are keen to invent more and more complex signal processing algorithms to be applied in mobile phones and in hearing aids. <coughs> and if you look to these algorithms, we see, oh, there is a big similarity. There is uh, 
feedback cancellation, there is noise suppression, there is um, directional processing using two microphones, for example. And thus the question comes up, how much can we learn from the mobile phones to improve the hearing aids and vice versa? Or how much can the mobile phones engineer learn from the hearing aids engineers and vice versa? So let's have a look to the situation where we use the mobile phone in the noisy environment. We have a near-end talker and we have the connection, let's say, to fixed network telephone. There is a quiet room, there's no background noise, but here is a lot of background noise which we cannot control. So the near-end listener experiences the clean speech from the far end and the local acoustical background noise. And the transmitted speech is limited to 3.4 kilohertz, which is still the old-fashioned bandwidth of a telephone. And in the opposite direction, the listener here gets the noise and the speech, because the microphone captures the noise and the speech, and both is transmitted. And we can state that at both ends of the communication link, the listening effort is increased due to the noise and to the band limitation, and eventually the intelligibility is decreased. For the hearing aids, the situation is first, in the first approach, completely different. We have a much wider range of frequencies. In the so-called hearing area, we see here the threshold of hearing, and we have here the upper limit where it becomes uncomfortable or even um, dangerous or painful, so we should keep a level in between. The speech is much wider in terms of frequencies as uh, we have it on the telephone, and music is even much wider, and the sound pressure level dynamic is much wider. So that is normal hearing. How looks like impaired hearing? Impaired hearing is, first of all, the raising of the hearing threshold. So you will not hear a sound which is below the hearing threshold and we need amplification, amplification which has to be frequency depending and individually adapted to the person with the hearing loss. But amplification alone does not help because if we amplify this here to come up here, a sound which is here will go through the ceiling and cause pain and damage. So we need compression, frequency dependent amplification and compression. And this is what usually people think is what a hearing aid is doing, but you need more because the hearing loss is much more complex. There is the masking effect. The masking effect is known from psychoacoustics. We have one sound, for example, at 500 hertz and the second sound at 1 kilohertz and the lower frequency component produces what is called the masking threshold any tone which is below the masking threshold cannot be heard. If it is above the threshold, you can hear it. So the red could be, for example, the acoustic background noise, and the blue could be the speech which is received. And then this guy could clearly recognize, understand the speech. <coughs> In case of a hearing loss, the masking thresholds and the frequency resolution is much wider and here we see if the red one would be the noise, the blue speech would be hidden, and we have to do something, either to reduce the noise, or if we can do, to increase the speech level. So we can state a similar problem, increase of listening effort and decrease of intelligibility, and uh, due to the fact that we have a limited hearing area and stronger masking effects. But there are acoustical distinctions and there are synergies and I would like to start with the acoustical distinctions. Modern hearing aids have two microphones, so distance is typically 8 millimeters or 1 centimeters and uh, usually people get two hearing aids which are working independently and then it is called bilateral. On both sides we have two hearing aids that drew, try to do the best and uh, have no idea what the other hearing aid is doing. So we can do some beam forming with differential microphone processing, for example, and noise reduction. But the future, in future we see 
instead of bilateral, we see binaural processing. So the both hearing aids talk to each other and help each other and exchange information. And there's a wide range of exchanging information. Is it just control or is it even complete audio from one side to the other to implement a nice beamformer, for example? Smartphones have, meanwhile, two microphones. Well, the first idea was we have one for, for speech and, and one for the video on top of it. But if you have two microphones, you can use one as the primary microphone and the top microphone as the auxiliary microphone. And then we can talk about using that for noise suppression, for example, to get the noise here and the speech there and to improve the noisy speech. And the first attempt is to study the acoustics, to measure what is called the coherence. The coherence is a function of a frequency and it tells us about the correlation between the two microphones at this frequency in a normalized fashion. And if the distance is 10 centimeters, we have this behavior, that's a theory, and if it is one centimeter, it looks like that. So we can say in the mobile phone, we have um, almost no coherence or correlation beyond 2 kilohertz or 1.8 kilohertz, but with the hearing at microphones, we have a much higher cutoff frequency. So far we don't know how to use that, but we have to take that into account and it will turn out it's important to know about the coherence functions of the two microphones. But if we have on both sides of the head microphones that uh, is even wider than with the mobile phone, 17 centimeters, we can use two microphones at a distance of centi 17 centimeters. We have the same curve as before, but now the cutoff frequency here is not 1.8 kilohertz, it's below 1 kilohertz. It's even more narrow, so only at very low frequencies we have correlation, and you can measure that. And you can argue what does mean high and low. Let's say if it is below 0.5, it's low, and if it is above, it's high. And if it is uh, very high, 0.9, you can use different techniques. And if it is very low, 0.1, you have to use different techniques for noise suppression. Now, between the microphones, we have the head. And if you place the head in between and measure once more, we see that the cutoff frequency is even lower. It's due to the shadowing effect of the head. The cutoff frequency is now about 500 hertz. And there is also a nice theory and a model, and we see the cut of frequency re go to moves towards 500 hertz. But there is speech. And usually, we expect that a person having hearing aids will look into the direction to his partner who is speaking. So the speech comes more or less from the front. And in theory, the coherence is one. It's, actually, it's very high in comparison to the noise over all frequencies. And that can be used to distinguish between speech and noise and to reduce the background noise. Now let's study once more the mobile phone and do some measurements. And we have to distinguish between the handset mode and the hands-free mode. Oh, although hands-free is often like this here, but that's the technical term or we can say the loud speaking mode of the mobile phone. And in the loud speaking mode of the mobile phone, we have more or less the same noise characteristics in both microphones if the background noise is diffuse noise. And we have the theoretical correlation we have seen before with cutoff frequency of 1.8 kilohertz. And the theoretical coherence of speech is one because the speaker is usually in front of the mobile phone. And they see, actually, you can measure something like that. But there is more than just coherence. If we study the handset mode of the mobile phone, the primary microphone gets more speech than the secondary microphone. But the noise coming from around is more or less has the same level and the same power spectral density. You see no big differences, but you see big level differences of a frequency 
between the microphones, the top and the bottom micro microphone. What about the level differences with the hearing aids? It's obvious if you have two microphones at a distance of one centimeter, there is no level, big significant level difference. And if you have two hearing aids on both sides and the speaker is in front, we even have, don't have big level differences between both sides for the speech and for the noise. And this has also to be taken, or can be taken into account by in designing algorithms. Yeah, and finally, we should not neglect the audio bandwidth. On the telephone, we still have 3.4 kilohertz as the upper limit that has reason from history of analog uh, telephony. And if we see here some sound like S, the frequency content, the most of it is even beyond 3.4 kilohertz. And there's a, a, some, uh, yeah, campaign is too much. Quite for some while, we tried to improve the telephone by introducing what is called wideband speech coding. That's the technical term, and wideband means seven kilohertz. Meanwhile, the marketing people at the network operators have found a better name. They call it HD voice. So everyone knows what it is, and HD voice is on the move, but for quite some while. And you, I guess, I don't know if someone of you had the chance to use an HD telephone. Although UK is very ahead of the, this uh, development because in the 3G networks in UK, you can, uh, can uh, book some service which is called HD voice. You need a better codec, but hearing aids have a much, even much wider frequency band. And it's a matter of the sampling frequency which is used, uh, is it uh, 20, 22, 24 kilohertz. So we have some distinctions, but we have also synergies. And uh, starting with the synergies, we take the top view on the mobile phone and on the hearing aid and see, oh, what is similar, what is different? And uh, from this perspective, the mobile phone looks like that. We have three sections, which is enhancement, coding, and modulation. Obviously, modulation, we know, we need to transmit for radio transmission. And coding is speech compression and error protection. And uh, if we would like to compare the mobile phone in terms of signal processing with the hearing aid, we first of all think about enhancement. And enhancement has four blocks. There is echo cancellation to compensate the loudspeaker signal which is fed back to the microphone <coughs> and to the far end and the two-way delay in the GSM network is 180 milliseconds, and if you have a call from mobile to mobile, it might even be two times 180 milliseconds. So we should prevent that we get, have here some echo loops. The mobile phones have two microphones, and we can exploit these two microphones for directional processing, whatever it means, to improve the speech and to reduce the noise. But the echo cancel is not perfect, there is residual echo, and the directional processing is not perfect, there is residual background noise, and therefore we have what is called the post filter to compress residual echoes and to reduce background noise, like some adaptive Wiener filter. And the last block operates on the receive signal. Here we have uh, two functions, we call one of that is called listening enhancement. Listening enhancement, we try to modify the received speech for the guy at the near end who has acoustic background noise which cannot be modified. So what we can do, we can amplify the signal. But we have a tiny loudspeaker, so we have to take care of the loudspeaker and we have to take care of the ear. And what we can do is to redistribute the energy of the frequency to improve intelligibility. That is one idea. And there is a second nice uh, function that is artificial wideband extension. That's very questionable from an information theoretical point of view. We transmit 3.4 kilohertz and we would like to expand the signal such that it sounds like a wideband signal with 7 kilohertz. I will come back to this later. So we have the four blocks and there is some control. We did not we need not to explain it here. We look to the 
hearing aid, the basic function of a hearing aid. We have four blocks, we have feedback suppression, we have two microphones, we have a loudspeaker, we have directional processing, and we have noise reduction and de-reverberation, and we need dynamic compression and amplification to compensate for the hearing loss as far as possible. Since quite a long time, hearing aids, even in the analog domain, have an additional audio input for a telephone coil or analog FM receivers to transmit audio signals from some source, like a telephone, to the hearing aid. And therefore, a digital hearing aid should also have some audio input. But if it is digital, we need a digital receiver. In modulation, we need error correction, channel decoding, and we need audio or speech decoding. And uh, we see that the hearing aids are connected with different devices. Meanwhile, most of the hearing aid manufacturers offer a solution uh, where the remote control to the hearing aid is combined with a relay, and the relay is operating with Bluetooth. And we get an audio signal from the MP3 player to the relay, and then it is transmitted over a very short distance with a very special low-power modulation and coding scheme to the hearing aid. So the hearing aid now has a digital receiver, it has a channel decoder, error correction, and it has a source decoder. You could ask, why didn't they choose the Bluetooth directly and implemented that in the hearing aid? The problem is the battery. Bluetooth is by far too much power consuming. And uh, I learned just two weeks ago that uh, hearing aid manufacturers have joined uh, the Bluetooth standardization group and they start to discuss about some low power, low delay Bluetooth mode which maybe in the future is standardized and you could transmit immediately to the hearing aid. But that is future. If the two hearing aids operate in the binaural mode, they have to exchange information. And what the, the hearing aid engineers would like to have is that there is access to both microphones on both sides. Yeah, is that the usual time you close? Time, yes. <laughs> yeah. Last orders. <laughs> it's probably best if we can continue and restart the system. Yeah. Yeah. It'll need one or two minutes. We need we need uh, a beamer. <laughs> <laughs> we need transmission between the two hearing aids, and then we have to expand the block diagram. And uh, the ideal solution would be to transmit both microphone signals from one side to the other side and from this side to this side. So you have a radio link through the head, but you, you will not tell it to the customers because they don't like it. Uh, <laughs> the problem is, is power consumption. Uh, I, I talked to, to a medical doctor in, in Aachen. We, have some cooperation with the medical department there. And he said, um, well, if he can prove that it helps, and that was related to cochlear implants, we can implant uh, a wire in the head beyond the skin. So you don't need radio transmission. But I think that's not the preferred solution. <laughs> Nearly. Yeah. <laughs> Now, the block diagram, you can imagine, looks very similar like the block diagram of the mobile phone. And therefore, we may ask the question, can we reuse some algorithms which we know from the mobile phone, we can apply or modify it and reuse it in the hearing aid and vice versa. But we know the, the constraints are somewhat different. I think it's just a minute. It's coming. Do I need to? It's okay. It's okay. Ah, oh, fine. Now, this is a block diagram of the intelligent 
hearing aid and you see the same blocks as we have had before in uh, the mobile phone enhancement, coding and modulation. Therefore, it's worthwhile to, to study some algorithms and uh, what I have done here, I have selected some of the algorithms, project work in my team over the last years and it's single and dual microphone noise reduction and it's intelligibility enhancement, it's artificial bandwidth extension, wind noise reduction and then a very strange thing at the end which may be called spatial HD telephony. And I addressed the question behind is, can we reuse? So, single microphone noise reduction, we have one microphone, we would like to suppress the noise and there's a, a standard approach for many years which is called spectral subtraction, but actually it's a spectral weighting. We get here the noisy samples, we have a DFT, we have, for example, a DFT of 256 points, we have a DFT coefficient that we multiply it with a weighting factor and the weighting factor is between 0 and 1 and if in a frequency bin there is only noise, a reasonable choice would be that the weighting factor is 0 and if there is only speech it should be 1 and the art of weighting is to find the right compromise. So just a real value weight and one of the many many rules which exist is called the Wiener filter. And the Wiener filter can ex be expressed like this here uh, here we need an estimate of the power spectral density of the noise and an estimate of the power spectral density of X, which is here. This is easy to find, but this is difficult to identify. There are solutions with voice activity detections and others which are called minimum statistics. And there are many, many rules and the question is which is the best rule? Uh, statistical estimation and complicated stochastics, I will present another one which is very simple, which is a psychoacoustic rule. So we have here the, the, the main part, this is the psychoacoustic weighting, we have the gain factor which is between 0 and 1, and the P stands for psychoacoustic. We have here a block which delivers the estimate of the background noise, power spectral density, and we have in the background a first spectral weighting, filter to get in some first version of a somewhat cleaned speech spectrum. It, that's the traditional spectral weighting and we use that to estimate the masking threshold which is now produced by the speech and might mask noise. Just the other way <coughs> we have studied the masking effect before. And the psychoacoustic rule gets the masking threshold at a certain frequency in frame lambda and gets the estimate of the background noise. And then we have to find some intelligent rule which exploits the masking effect. Well, it's not so trivial to understand, but it's, it's actually quite simple. What you would like to have in a frequency bin there is where we have only noise, we would like to achieve what we would expect. We would like to have a knob where we can re reduce the level of a background noise. We don't want to change the background noise, the characteristics. We still would like to recognize, oh, that's in the disco or that's on the street. Just reduce the noise. So the reasonable idea is that in a frequency bin mu, where we have no speech, we would like to have at the end alpha times n. And the alpha could be 0.1 or 0.2 whatsoever. And in the frequency bins where we have speech, we would allow more noise if it is masked by the speech. So the error which occurs is we apply some H and we would like to have alpha. So the error between is H minus alpha or alpha minus H and we, if we quantify <coughs> that in terms of power, we have to square it and we see the Residual noise is the background power spectral density times alpha minus HP to the power of 2. And we would like to keep that below the masking threshold. We could think about that, so we have the masking threshold. 
then we consider what happens to the speech. The speech component is multiplied by the same weight h and for the speech we would like to have h should be as close as possible to 1 because we have no modification and no distortion of the speech. For the noise we say it has not to be here at 0. We, we go not, not beyond alpha in, in that direction here. But as there is a masking threshold which is produced by the speech, maybe in neighboring frequency bins, we can now allow that the noise can be larger than alpha. It can be here, can be up to there. So what we can do is we say it should be equal and it's very easy to figure out this rule. It looks more complicated as it is. We have to divide on both sides by the phi and n and we have to take the square and we have to guarantee that we have no amplification, therefore we take a minimum of that. And uh, the result is we allow larger weighting factors, so we reduce the speech distortion, we increase the level of the noise, but hopefully we cannot hear it. Now let's listen to one example. We have the noisy speech, we have here a very simple spectral subtraction rule which is uh, magnitude subtraction, no additional tricks to reduce the musical tones. Uh, we have here the waiting rule, also no spe specific tricks, just to test if the idea of masking m might work. So we first listen to the input and then to the process signal in both cases. In the course of a December tour in Yorkshire, I rode for a long distance in one of the public coaches on the day preceding Christmas. In the course of a December tour in Yorkshire, I rode for a long distance in one of the public coaches on the day preceding Christmas. In the course of a December tour in Yorkshire, I rode for a long distance in one of the public coaches on the day preceding Christmas. In the first example we have the typical musical tones which can be reduced by additional tricks which I did not use here. And in the second example you have the impression the noise is just reduced. It sounds as before. Now in the simulation we can process uh, independently the noisy speech, then we can process the speech and then we can process with the same adaptive filter just the noise. So we have access to the residual noise and let's listen to the residual noise of a plain spectral subtraction and the psychoacoustic rule. If masking would work, then we would expect that the noise will increase and we will be modulated by the speech. So masking really can be exploited and we see it's modulated and you cannot hear it. So we could <coughs> at least say, yeah, single channel noise reduction, we need it in the mobile phone and we need it in the hearing aid. But then we have, might have to take into consideration if we use this specific rule that the masking thresholds are different in, in, the, in the impaired hearing. My second example, the mobile phone in the loudspeaking mode. We have studied the coherence function and we, we know there's a, a strong coherence for the speech and there is this typical uh, coherence for two microphones at a distance of 10 centimeters with the cutoff frequency somewhere by 1.8 kilohertz. Without going too far into the details, we can calculate theoretically and practically, we can calculate the cross power spectral density between the two microphones, so the cross correlation and the spectrum of that. And it can be described by the coherence function of speech plus the coherence function of noise times the power spectral density of the noise. And the gamma S and the gamma N are different as we have seen. And we can use that. Uh, there are no power level differences. The power spectral densities of the noise are the same. 
and it's just a few steps to get a nice estimate of the background noise. We don't need, for those who are familiar with it, minimum statistics of voice activity detection. We have access to the outer spectrum of X1 and X2, and we need the coherence functions. Maybe we have measured that before and we are satisfied and say this is the coherence we have here, or we do it more cleverly by adapting automatically the coherence function. This is a solution by Christoph Nelke. He will present that in two weeks at the ICASP. And I uh, have here one example. Let's listen to the input. Now we have two microphones. A chicken leg is a rare dish. Rice is often served in round bowls. The birch canoe slid on the smooth planks. Glue the sheet to the dark blue background. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. A chicken leg is a rare dish. Rice is often served in round bowls. The birch canoe slid on the smooth planks. Glue the sheet to the dark blue background. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. The noise here is much more instationary and as soon as we have two microphones and we exploit the characteristics at the acoustic front and in terms of the coherence we can do much better than with a single microphone solution. Yeah, we could pl apply it to the hearing aid but the coherence will be different there. And uh, if we do that we need a full connection between both sides because we have to calculate the cross correlation and we have to transmit all the time the signal across the head. Example number three, that's intelligibility enhancement, or we called it listening enhancement. We know the problem is that he receives clean speech and has background noise which cannot be modified. So we can increase the volume, but the tiny loudspeaker says stop, that's it. But what we can do is we redistribute the signal energy per frame over frequency and take into account the time varying spectrum of the noise. The target is not to optimize the, the tone or quality, the target is to optimize speech intelligibility. The solution is we operate in the spectral domain and we have spectral weights, very similar to noise suppression, but these spectral weights are calculated from the power spectral density of the clean received speech and the power spectral density of uh, the background noise, which we can access because the mobile phone has a microphone and we have a noise suppression system in the mobile phone and in the noise suppression system there is anyhow there is estimation of a power spectral density for the purpose of noise suppression and we can use that to modify the signal in the received uh, Direction. But we have to take into account the maximum power which is allowed. Uh, we should not damage the ear and we should not damage the loudspeaker. And that ends up with a nice optimization problem. How to distribute per frame the energy between the frequency bins. So in a certain frequency bin we have a noise level which is given because there is background noise. We cannot change it but we can change the power of the received speech in that frequency bin we can increase and we use what is called the speech intelligibility index and we can study the contribution of a certain frequency bin to the intelligibility. And it turns out if it is too low, intelligibility is low at a, up, up from a certain level, given that this is fixed, we have full contribution to intelligibility and it doesn't matter to increase more, to waste energy for that frequency bin. Even if we do, do much more intelligibility will be reduced due to nonlinear effects in the ear. And there is a solution, Bastian Sauer, that said it's a closed form solution but it's iterative. So it's semi-closed solution to distribute the energy between the bands and then to iterate and to resort it and that has to be done in real time. I would like to demonstrate that here we have uh, our dummy head at the motorway and there is a, is a mobile phone, the dummy head has ears and microphones and we can record that and later on we can process that, we can listen to that. So all these demonstrations should be listened to with headphones but we don't have so many headphones here, so I will play it by loudspeaker and you get some impression about the 
intelligibility, the speech intelligibility index is too low, it's 0.3, it should be here in this area, then it's good. Now we optimize the power allocation without changing the total power of, or better we should say the energy of a frame, and we can increase. Let's listen to which extent we can increase. Hello, Bastian, this is Bridget, how are you? We're planning to have a barbecue tomorrow, and you're welcome to join us. If you come, could you please prepare your delicious pasta salad? Thanks a lot, and see you tomorrow. Bye. Hello, Bastian, this is Bridget, how are you? We're planning to have a barbecue tomorrow, and you're welcome to join us. If you come, could you please prepare your delicious pasta salad? Thanks a lot, and see you tomorrow. Bye. Now, the realistic demonstration would be to have a headphone, because in, at the motorway, the, usually the ear is open and you get the noise completely here and the other ear is partly covered by the mobile phone and the signal is modified. So it's m much more, much more clearer the dis difference between that. But I, I guess you get, got some idea. Now we could also allow more power if, if uh, we are allowed to do, let's say, 6 dB, and the intelligibility is almost the same as the optimized. Let's listen, P0 plus 6 dB, and in the next step, we, in the next step, we will also allow 6 dB more, but now redistribute the energy, and we can increase the intelligibility. Hello, Bastian, this is Bridget, how are you? We're planning to have a barbecue tomorrow, and you're welcome to join us. If you come, could you please prepare your delicious pasta salad? Thanks a lot, and see you tomorrow. Bye. Hello, Bastian, this is Bridget, how are you? We're planning to have a barbecue tomorrow, and you're welcome to join us. If you come, could you please prepare your delicious pasta salad? Thanks a lot, and see you tomorrow. Bye. Yeah. We could think about using it in the hearing aid, but how? In the hearing aid, we have the microphone, we have a noisy signal, but if there is some audio link into the hearing aid, the person will perceive the noise from outside and will perceive the clear signal via the audio, audio link, and then we could probably use that and have to take into consideration the hearing loss characteristics. Example number four, artificial wideband extension. I explained the idea, we have still the narrowband world, but at the receiving end, we do, by digital processing, expand artificially the bandwidth. So we need D2A with 16 kilohertz, where the network is operating at eight kilohertz. This is one of the solutions, and uh, it's a quite complicated, we have here a block which is called extended spectral envelope. So we try to estimate the frequency response of some LPC synthesis filter for the wider frequency band. And this is a process where we extract from the narrow band signal, which is interpolated from 8 to 16 kilohertz, some features. It's a pattern recognition process. We have some code books that is the different versions of the spectral envelope. And we have some statistical model. And uh, then we estimate the envelope. So that's the first two steps after interpolation. And then we apply this as an LPC analysis filter. If this, this here is uh, interpolated, we get some residual signal, which goes up, up to 3.4 kilohertz. And then it's very, very small. And we should expand the excitation if uh, the signal is unvoiced, so we have narrowband noise and we can duplicate it over frequency to get wideband noise. If it is harmonic because it's a vowel, we have clearly the idea of what to do by modulation or switching to expand the harmonic spectrum, which goes up to 3.4, now to uh, replicate it at the higher frequencies. And then we apply the wider spectral envelope and get wideband speech. So this is the mathematics. You see clearly it's uh, a mixture of uh, uh, pattern recognition, Markov modeling, and statistical estimation at, at the end. This is one example. Here we see uh, frequency and time. This is the narrowband speech. The lower limit is somewhere by 
at the 300 hertz and 3.4, maybe this is a little, bit, a little bit too high. Let's listen to that. It switches. Well, three or four months run along, and it was well into the winter now. I had been to school most all the time and could spell and read and write just a little and could say the multiplication table up to six times seven is 35. And I don't reckon I could ever get any further than that if I was to live forever. I don't take no stock in mathematics anyway. Yeah, uh, you get the impression there is some white band extension it's not as good as a true wideband coding approach, but it might help to improve the acceptance of a new mobile phone which has a wideband coder. If you buy it, you don't know anyone who has such a device, but from the very beginning, if it has wideband extension, you get some improvement. Yeah, can we use it in the hearing aid? Clearly, yes, if we have the external link from this narrowband telephone to the hearing aid, we could think about applying the artificial wideband extension in the hearing aid if we have the signal processing power or in the relay if it is still there. Example number five, wind noise reduction. Wind noise is a very nasty noise because it's very strong, uh, low frequencies and the cutoff frequency is varying. It can go up, up to four kilohertz. So it's very easy to get rid of the wind noise, just cut it out. Then it's gone, as done here, but then you, we are missing the low frequency parts, maybe up to four kilohertz, and that's the speech, more or less. So what we do here is we apply artificial bandwidth extension. We have here the harmonic structure in the higher band, and we can use these techniques to synthesize the lower frequencies. And the block diagram looks like that. There's a high pass, and we have here parameter estimation for vocoder, the pitch period, a gain factor, LPC coefficients. We synthesize speech. We apply it to a low pass with variable cutoff frequency, which is determined by the wind. And we add it to the signal where we have cut it out, the low frequency part. This is one example here. We have the speech with wind noise. And now you can limit the cutoff frequency to 1.5 kilohertz or to 4 kilohertz to make it moderate or more aggressive and hopefully improve. The north wind and the sun were disputing which was the stronger when a traveler came along wrapped in a warm cloak. They agreed that the one who first succeeded in making the traveler take his cloak off. The north wind and the sun were disputing which was the stronger when a traveller came along wrapped in a warm cloak. They agreed that the one who first succeeded in making the traveller take his cloak off. The north wind and the sun were disputing which was the stronger when a traveller came along wrapped in a warm cloak. They agreed that the one who first succeeded in making the traveller take his cloak off. If it is more aggressive, it has more high pass characteristics, but once more, if you have it at the ear, the wind noise is much more unpleasant than listening to that by a loudspeaker. Yeah, wind noise reduction, it's of interest to hearing aids too, clearly yes, but it might be easier in the mobile phone because we can cut off the frequency, if you like, at 300 hertz and say, well, it's telephone speech, it's sufficient, but in the hearing aid, we cannot cut off at 300 hertz. So it should go down to very low frequencies. So we have different limits. Now my last example, one of my favorite examples. It's, it's, it's called HD telephony. If I'm saying that, I'm not sure if that is a technical term at all so far. We propose here with something which we call the HD telephone or audio conferencing system. So what is, is it? We have some environment A and some environment B and the typical is the environment A is the meeting room at the airport and the envi environment B is the beach. And the guy on the right side should attend the meeting but he cannot travel. So he has some replacement there, a dummy head with two microphones and a loudspeaker and eventually some simplification but let's assume it's a dummy head and we have two channel transmission of the network and he has the headset here and he uses 
presently only a single microphone. And uh, there is a demonstration we made, and you can listen to that. Here you see the dummy head, and there's a, an address which is binaural minus telephony. It's not that commercial as it looks like. It's just a YouTube video <laughs> under this address. And you should listen by, by headphone, and it, it really makes fun, I can tell you, if you listen to that. Because you can this have spatial hearing, you can listen who is speaking, even if two people are speaking simultaneously, you can separate, because the bandwidth is more than 3.4 kilohertz. And our experimental setup is such, here you see the microphone, it's very simple, and uh, we have built a demonstrator, but if you think about that, you need more, you need echo cancellation here, because you have crosstalk, and you need a new codec. But it's, it's not that unrealistic because we will have the LTE mobile networks which are, are packet-based transmission and then it's much easier to introduce a new codec and to say, well, we would like to transmit binaural signals. But uh, the most fun you will get if you apply it to groups and then it looks like this. You have a group of people, it could also be wireless here, only one has the two microphones and the other listen. But the other speak also, and if you can visit us at the Institute, we can give you a demonstration like that, and it's very impressive. You can talk with everyone, and you have the impression he is here, but he's not here, he's in the other room. It's talking as being there. Fantastic. If you have listened to that, you will never uh, you'll throw away your telephone uh, conferencing equipment you have so far, the telephone, the simple loud speaking telephone. Yeah, if we can use that to the mobile, uh, the mobile phone, that's clear, but what does it mean with respect to the hearing aid? Yeah, I would say first of all, we can, may learn as the mobile phone engineers from the hearing aid domain about head related transfer functions, because if you think about that, you don't listen with your own head, because in the meeting room there's the dummy head or something, replacement. Maybe we can recalculate the head related transfer functions to improve that. Yeah, and there's more. We could continue. I have addressed that more or less and would like to come to the conclusions. And the conclusion is there are synergy effects, obviously, in terms of signal processing between mobile phones and hearing aids, and we have discussed some examples and there might be more. But there are also distinctions, partly significantly different constraints for the design of normal and impaired hearing, the coherence function, the level differences, the audio bandwidth, not to forget the power consumption, not to forget the latency, not to forget the battery. So what we see is that hearing aids and mobile phones seem to approach each other. So that's, that's a nice statement. And uh, we see there's lots of room for improvement. But if we have that nice thing, which is called binaural telephone, then we have two microphones here, and we have a headset, and we have a processing device, a very powerful processing device, then it's not to a big step to imagine that you can have a binaural telephone and the hearing aid in one device, and this device is the smartphone. And you see some movement in that direction. There are some attempts to, to provide what is called the hearing app on the smartphone, where you use the microphone in the smartphone, mono, and some hearing aid functions like compression and amplification. Maybe that's something for the beginners, for compensating moderate hearing aid. In any case, we see there is much um, room for improvement and there, uh, there's much synergy and there are many, many interesting open questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
I, I don't know how to distribute that. We can do that. Copies of the slides. If you're happy to give them out, we can arrange it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, and just a, an, an observation. Am I right that quite a number of audio codecs, uh, like in our wide band, uh, implement bandwidth extension already, actually, as part of Yeah, process? that's right. That's right, yeah. I've got a question actually, which is, um, given that there's been a lot of rapid development of mobile phone technology in the last, let's say, 10 years, has, has that kind of really benefited the development of, mo of, of um, hearing aid design as a kind of knock-on effect? So a lot of the research has been done probably with a commercial justification for mobile phone development, but, but sort of there's, there's been you know, a dual <coughs> benefit from that. Not that much as you would expect, because it's not that obvious. If you see that, you say, "Ah, oh, clear, that's obvious." Um, yeah, but uh, I, I would say uh, the young engineers now starting at the hearing aid manufacturers, they know about cellular radio and mobile phones and the signal processing, and that's a way how the diffusion takes place. Then there are uh, corporations with, with institutes like ours, uh, Patrick. Naylor, and uh, we helped the manufacturer to implement some of these ideas. But at the very beginning, I, I was not sure if that would be possible to have a Viterbi decoder in the hearing aid for channel decoding. But it is there, meanwhile. And to have a, a binaural link from the left to the right side, it reduces the operation time because the battery is not getting larger, but the microelectronic circuits are getting better. And maybe you switch with binaural link on only on if you need it at the cocktail party. Sure. So thank you for your, your talk, Peter. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, assessment or evaluation of quality um, because with the mobile phone application targeting normal hearing people then you could uh, measure if it makes an improvement because you can get many subjects with normal hearing and ask them if it's better and do a, a test or, or something like this. On the other hand with the hearing aids the hearing loss is I suppose somewhat unique to each different yeah. user and uh, also they are not able to be objective because they are indeed not only the, the subject but the user at the same time. Um, how can you therefore test if any of your algorithms really bring an improvement for a hearing aid user? Just by making tests with potential hearing aid users or with hearing aid users and I, I know that companies have a, a group of people which are invited to test the latest developments of the hearing aids. And, and partly, well, you, you know, the implementation is, is a very big step. If you have it in the silicon, there might be still some possibility to modify parameters or more and more we see DSPs there or partly DSPs you can take, change the software. So that what we are doing is they have real-time simulation of the hearing aid on a laptop. And uh, then you can play with the algorithms and tune. And uh, it's, it's even difficult uh, to ask uh, elder people, is that better or th that? So they don't know w w w w what to recognize or to identify, but uh, they have mostly younger people who have some hearing loss and should you wear a hearing aid or not. Thank you. Any further questions? Um, I'm just curious to know um, the kind of computational effort that goes into each of these algorithms. So uh, in your prototypes, what is that you have implemented these algorithms on? Uh, are they off-the-shelf DSPs or are they FPGAs? or? 
In the mobile phones, we have DSPs. In the hearing aid, it's a philosophy of the company. So they partly have DSPs, they partly have uh, um, ASICs, for example, a filter bank in ASIC, ASICs, and, or an FFT as ASIC, and then the processing as, as a DSP. And there are very powerful DSPs <coughs> with computational uh, powers. I think you had yesterday one example, it was 40 MIPS or more, 40 MIPS, quite a lot. We could not imagine that a couple of years ago. And uh, the idea of having at least for the moderate hearing aid, the mobile phone as a hearing aid, the, mo the hearing aid app on the mobile phone, that's a big danger for the industry, for the hearing aid industry. Mm -hmm. Because the price difference between a smartphone and a hearing aid is a factor of 10 roughly, and you need only one smartphone and two hearing aids. So they are getting very nervous about competition. Following up on that point, uh, when television uh, broadcasters try to encourage development of uh, things for people with hearing impairments, there was some uh, reaction against having specific items associated with the person who was hard of hearing just as with the hearing aid nobody worries about producing a mobile phone but they don't like to be seen to have a hearing aid if that division goes within the next generation yeah. uh, can you see if you like a combined audio uh, instrument yeah I could imagine so the, the mp3 listeners and iPhone users, they walk around all the day with the <laughs> yes, <laughs> with the hearing aid. But then hearing so, aid, so yeah. the hearing aid people, uh, if you could get that accepted, yeah. there would be, uh, if you like, a coming together of the technologies, yeah. which I'm sure would make life easier, larger yeah. batteries for a start. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that's, as you really, as you just said, it's a matter of, of generation. Yes, yeah. thank you. How do you find the quality of the transducers varies between phones and uh, hearing aids? And does it matter if you're using a cheap smartphone versus a good smartphone as to whether the algorithms can cope with background noise or the, the noise floor of the, the device itself? Does that make any sense? The, the mobile phones, I'm not sure if I got the question correctly. In most of the mobile phones we have, uh, we have noise suppression and when I'm going to buy a new phone, I first listen to that. And then you will recognize that there is big differences in terms of noise suppression in the send and in the receive directions. They implement it such that you get the best sound as the one who has paid for the mobile phone. And if you listen at the fixed network, then you will see there's a big difference. Some have very aggressive noise reduction um, with musical tones and others have very tiny sound. So there's a big difference. And uh, your question goes more to the transmission to the... My Transuses. question was more, so the, the hearing aid is 10 times the price of the smartphone. Yeah. Are the microphones 10 times better? Or are they the same quality? Or how does that vary? Yeah, at least they have to be selected. I don't know if you have someone here from hearing aid manufacturers. I know they have to be carefully selected that the pairs fit to, together. So the microphones targeted at, at the hearing aid market are, are generally very good sensitivity, very high repeatability, um, and far better control than the ones that you get in mobile phones. It's absolutely yeah. Right. yeah. I typically get a plus or minus 3 dB batch variation for a mobile phone. Do you mean an absolute sensitivity rather than sensitivity? Um, yes, I guess. Compared to half a dB for the equivalent going to hearing but there's also aging of the microphones and that can change and then you can, can think about 
digital equalization of the microphones that might help to use cheaper microphones. But your point is, is very relevant. Um, if this is the hearing aid of the future, maybe the headset is more expensive than just the headset for the binaural telephone. Do you, do you optimize for headphones or for earbuds? I mean, clearly hearing aids will be earbuds, I guess, but with the mobile phone, there's two different use cases. Which are... Yeah, in a, in a first approach, what you see um, as the hearing aid app, there's just one microphone of the mobile phone. There's, there's no optimization, no head-related effects. And the second step is, yeah, we have the microphones here, and then you can refine it. And then, obviously, very interesting open questions come up. What can you do if the microphones are not exactly in the right position? Sorry, just a simple question. Um, in the binaural, uh, you know, have they uh, these uh, eight uh, hearing aids? Uh, do you always consider that the functionality of the two ears are the same, or can the system be somehow, you know, can the system compromise between, you know, if the if the ears are not functioning the same? <coughs> yeah, yeah, they are adapted, uh, adjusted. If you get a hearing aid, you 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 walk uh, um, every second week to the shop, and it takes ten sessions until it is really adjusted to both ears. But for the binaural processing, uh, one idea is we have here on the left and on the right we have two microphones, and now if we are able to have the four signals on each side, we can implement a much better beamformer. We can do null steering in the direction of the most prominent noise source. And that is independent of the hearing loss. And then you get the signal which is improved. And then you have to adjust the levels and compression and so on to, re to compensate for the hearing loss. Looks like we've had a fantastic talk and some great questions, actually. Um, no further questions? Then I shall take the opportunity to thank Peter for his talk, which I found fascinating as well, as I'm sure most, most people have. Yeah, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you.